Welcome to the Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies. Today, we will have a conversation about what the post-COVID world will look like, what that will look like for Asia and the rest of the world. Today's keynote speaker is Dr. Jennifer Nuzo. She works for the Center of Health Security at the Department of Health and Engineering at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Mr. Hirokazu Saito, who is the advisor for Eurasian Affairs at Mitsubishi Corporation, will offer his views on how Eurasia and the Ukraine will impact the recovery of this post-COVID world. Finally, Dr. William Brooks, a visiting scholar at the Reischauer Center, will offer his remarks on how, on a macroscopic level, Asia will recover and what we'll see going forward with US-Japan cooperation. But first, I would like to introduce Dr. Kent Calder, who will serve as the moderator for today's event. Dr. Calder serves as the Vice Dean at Johns Hopkins SICE. Dr. Calder, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Neve. Um, I also welcome everyone to uh, the Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies. We're delighted. Uh, that you've all joined us, and we have an exciting program today. Um, as we all know, we've just passed uh, a two-year milestone, um, a, a bitter and tragic milestone, of course, in many ways. Uh, in uh, January, January 20th of 2020, we had the first uh, confirmed case in the United States, flowing on from earlier developments uh, in China and elsewhere. Um, on March 11th, 2020, of course, also a auspicious uh, date in Japan, um, a tragic date with the tsunami. Um, but in 2020, the World Health Organization also declared uh, a global pandemic uh, belatedly, but finally declared it, which of course is three, only three weeks uh, and two years ago now. Since then, of course, we've been through a lot, over 500 million people infected in nearly 200 countries. Sadly, over two, uh, six million fatalities nearly 1 million, and I was checking last night on the Coronavirus Resource Center website and over 978,000 in the United States. Recently, of course, we've seen a recent decline in fatalities. Not so long ago, uh, 2,000 a day, under uh, last night under uh, 700 uh, were reported. And so uh, in the United States, so seemingly a tremendous decline, but of course, an upsurge in Europe and some other places. So the question occurs, where are we going now? Is there light at the end of the tunnel finally? And of course, beyond uh, COVID-19, where are we going one month and more into the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Where are we going in world affairs? Not only the political questions, but the global uh, political economy, commodity markets, uh, huge refugee flows. What is going to be the nature of the post-COVID world? Today, as Neve mentioned, we have knowledgeable speakers who can speak to these fateful questions. First of all, to keynote our program today, we have someone with whom, uh, uh, who is a global figure, who was one of the very first to speak to the public uh, process on the uh, COVID pandemic with her testimonies on Capitol Hill. Uh, in the spring of 2020. Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, our speaker today, is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. She's also an associate professor in the development of environmental health and engineering and the Department of Epidemiology at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. 
In addition, she's Senior Fellow for Global Health at the Council on Foreign Relations. And I know that uh, many of us have seen her commentary in foreign affairs and a broad range of global publications. But in addition to all of these things, um, she also works uh, very concretely with uh, frontline health practitioners. She directs the Outbreak Observatory, which does operational resource research to improve outbreak preparedness and response. And finally, I should note, because I know we have a number of participants from Japan, that um, Dr. Nuzzo also uh, studied uh, Japanese. Uh, she has ties as well to Japan, including uh, to Toshiki-ken, north of Tokyo. So Jennifer, it's a real uh, pleasure to have you with us again and sincere thanks for joining us. We look forward to your remarks. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and for including me in the discussion. Um, it makes me um, wish I could dust off my Japanese <laughs> to, <laughs> to do this talk in, in, uh, in Japanese, but I unfortunately am, am not um, uh, So I will um, share my screen um, so that I can show you some data because I think as we go forward, we have to start with the data as our foundation for um, making uh, some, you know, forecasting what we could potentially see in the future. Um, so I have been studying, and thank you, um, Dr. Calder, for uh, acknowledging the fact that this is, um, we've just eclipsed the second anniversary of the first time the WHO used the word pandemic to describe what's uh, the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, it's often reported that they declared a pandemic. WHO doesn't have the authority to formally declare a pandemic, but they first used the word in uh, on March 11th of 2020. And I say that because, um, you know, for those of us who have been following the situation in, in Wuhan, um, you know, it became clear very, very early for me in early January that this virus was going to cause a global pandemic. As soon as we saw a uh, respiratory virus for which there was no pre-existing immunity that we knew of, and it was capable of person-to-person -person transmission, as an epidemiologist, I knew it was going to be everywhere on the planet um, very quickly. And so um, this is actually, a th thank you for mentioning our outbreak observatory. We do, do do operational research, trying to understand ongoing responses to infectious disease outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics with the goal of trying to get better at those things. Um, and one of the kind of functions of our observatory is to publish a weekly blog. So this was the first blog post we ever wrote about um, what is now the COVID-19 pandemic. It was from early January, 2020. And you know we've learned a tremendous amount about this virus and also our readiness for pandemics or more probably appropriately lack thereof. Um, as was mentioned, uh, you know, we are in a different phase now in the pandemic. Um, this is a screenshot of the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center uh, map. Uh, the map was started by my colleague, Dr. Lauren Gardner, who's in the School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins, um, but there's a larger site um, called the, the Corona Coronavirus Resource Center um, that I've been fortunate enough to be a part of. Um, I am, uh, in addition to contributing to the, the Coronavirus Resource Center site, helping to develop it, um, I consider myself a super user of the data because I'm constantly looking at it, trying to understand what's going on in the world and trying to translate that for decision makers and media, the public. Um, we are in a different phase right now. If you look at the upper right hand corner, you'll see the red bars, which are the weekly average reported cases worldwide. Um, it is lower than it was a few weeks ago. Um, you'll also see though, it's not consistently falling an uptick and then a bit of a downtick. Um, I actually expect the death numbers, which are the white bars below the red bars, um, sort of the second graph on the right-hand side, um, may pop up a bit in part because of that uptick at the end with um, the red bars. We know that deaths lag by about a month. So um, it's encouraging that we're seeing the deaths starting to fall now, but we could see a, um, a bit more of an, of an uptick um, resulting from the most recent surge of cases. I think probably the other significant thing I wanna point out is if you look at the left-hand side, 
the countries that are listed here are those that have, they're listed in order of how many cases they have reported in, in the past 28 days. Um, for the most of the pan, for most of the pandemic, the United States has been at the top of that list. Now you can't even see it because it has slipped down the list um, below what I could fit on this screen, um, showing that we are in very different circumstances than we were for the, for the majority of this pandemic. A number of the countries that I'm seeing here, like South Korea, I mean, South Korea hasn't been at the top of this list since really, you know, um, except with the exception of recent times, um, really since since the beginning. And in the beginning, it was partially a function of, of the level of surveillance. I will say all of the country's abilities to appear on this list is entirely dependent on how much testing they do. If you don't look for cases, you're not going to find infections. So, um, and that won't be included in countries' reports. So we always have to take these global numbers with a grain of salt and know that countries' capacities and willingness to find infections, to diagnose infections and to report them very much influences our understanding of how much COVID-19 there is in the world and where it is. Um, the kind of um, locus of transmission uh, globally has shifted. Um, you know, for the most part, uh, the United States has been shaded in quite darkly on the map uh, to the right. Um, but we are seeing uh, higher levels of, of cases being reported in Asia and in Europe. And um, this is sort of the, the new phase. You can see on the kind of squiggly lines um, on the left hand, left hand uh, graph, there are you know, a few squiggly lines that have gone up as of late, whereas the United States um, you know, has, has, has come down um, quite considerably. I pulled some of the um, country specific infection curves. So you can see um, these, I got these screenshots from this morning. So these are fairly up-to-date data. They may be from yesterday, but um, they show up-to-date. And as you can see, you know, a number of countries in Asia have really gone through a surge as of late. Um, for many of these countries, uh, this is the Omicron surge that the United States went through um, in late December, January. So they were shifted in time. They didn't have that surge at the same time that we did. It happened a bit later. Um, it's fortunate to see that in many places, the, the shape of their curves uh, are, is coming down, meaning the inf reported infections are starting to fall. Um, but as you can see, in many of these places, the infections rose quite sharply, and that's really been a hallmark of Omicron. It just accelerates incredibly quickly, and then it falls down very quickly. Now, that is challenging. That is absolutely challenging um, because the um, having such a large number of cases over a short period of time is tantamount to a flash flood. And even if a smaller percentage of the cases wind up going to the hospital in many places, as we have seen, certainly that's been the, UK, the case in the United States, just having that many cases over a short period of time, applying a small percentage to a large number of infections um, still winds up resulting in a large number of hospitalizations and unfortunately deaths. Um, but this is the situation that Omicron finds us in. I'm often asked, why is it that countries that really, and as you can see from these curves here, many countries, South Korea is a great example, the curve almost entirely flat to this most recent wave. Well, I think there are a few factors going on, but I absolutely do not want to um, undersell the role of the virus. And what we've seen with Omicron is that it is um, highly transmissible, more transmissible than early forms of the virus and more transmissible earlier with a shorter incubation period, meaning a shorter period of time between first and second generation cases. Because in some people, it tends to have more milder symptoms. It may be less notice of, noticed by the patient and may be less likely to be detected. All of those things make it much harder to control the spread of the virus using non-pharmaceutical interventions, public health measures that countries relied upon for the you know, first uh, year and a half of uh, this pandemic, and, and that when they were swift and adept with those measures, were able to keep their case numbers low. When I see countries that are, um, you know, have high levels of mask use and very aggressive testing efforts, and had been previous leaders, previous leaders in contact tracing, 
um, with case curves like this, I think that has to give us some humility about this virus and its ability to outrun our public health interventions. It's just a very small window of time with which to act to stop transmission. And that makes it very, very difficult to get ahead of the escalating case numbers. So what does that mean then going forward? Um, if some of the tools, I won't say they're not working because I am sure they're having an effect, but the tools alone are not enough to keep our curves flat. And so um, the, the, the non-pharmaceutical interventions alone. So people ask me, you know, what is this next phase about? What, what is, sh should we be paying attention to? And quite honestly, the thing that I pay the most attention to now is, is looking at vaccine coverage and what level of vaccine coverage countries have and whether or not they've been able to, in particular, protect their most vulnerable, the people who are most likely to wind up in the hospital or die from this virus. This is, in my view, the single biggest um, metric to be looking at because um, I think it's becoming increasingly clear. I mean, it is clear this virus is not going to disappear from the planet. It is going to be very, very, very difficult to keep infections to a minimum without complete fidelity in perpetuity. The non-pharmaceutical interventions that we use are pause buttons. As soon as we begin to release them, we should expect to see a resurgence of cases. The only way this pandemic ends, and it won't end in the sense that the virus will go away, it will end in the sense that we live with it differently. The only way this ends is through immunity. And it is far preferable for that immunity to happen as a result of a vaccination than um, first contact unprotected with the virus. But both types of immunity, infection with the virus and protection with vaccine will help to keep people out of the hospital and to keep them from dying. And that is, I believe, our top goal to make sure that doesn't happen, to keep hospitalizations and deaths to a minimum. And so we see the impact of vaccination coverage when we compare um, you know, how countries have done in um, this most recent Omicron wave. You know, um, on the left hand side, this is a relatively actually this is from last week graph of um, COVID um, vaccine boosters. Now, boosters aren't the be all end all, but they are, I think, an important metric, particularly when we talk about um, the over 50 population that may have been vaccinated quite a long time ago. That's a that's a population that's particularly um, benefited from by boosters. But if we look at that, we see disparities among um, a number of countries. And here I have um, South Korea, the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, and the United States. Um, we've also seen uh, countries like South Korea, for instance, increase the uh, vaccination coverage, particularly as they've gone through their, their most recent wave. And that's going to have a large effect. Um, you know, when we see Hong Kong, which until recently had some of the lowest vaccination coverage among these countries um, in terms of, of boosting its elderly population, Hong Kong also has very low overall vaccination coverage and particularly low uh, coverage of its elderly population. Um, and I've heard as well, this is more from colleagues that the coverage in, in care homes and in nursing home settings is, is also quite low. Um, hearing those statistics alone would make me fear that there would be large numbers of casualties um, from a, a wave of infections, which unfortunately has come to bear uh, in Hong Kong. And you can see that on the right hand graph. So it's critically important for countries to above all make sure they vaccinate adults and above all make sure that the people who are at highest risk for severe illness and death, and that includes at this point, the single biggest risk factor for that is age, that includes people particularly over the age of 65, um, to make sure they are um, as fully protected from vaccines as they can be. And if that means if they've been vaccinated a while ago, they may um, need a booster. That is the most important thing we can do to prevent hospitalizations and deaths and to prevent health systems from becoming overwhelmed. Globally, I think, you know, when we're talking about what's going to happen again, vaccination coverage is a thing I care most about. And unfortunately we see huge heterogeneity in terms of how much coverage countries have been able to achieve. It is unsurprisingly, um, the, the disparities in coverage, vaccination coverage are income driven. They're not income driven, but they are strongly correlated with income. So we see um, lowest coverage in the low in low income countries. We also see that's the place where um, deaths are increasing the fastest. So again, if we want to understand how this is all going to play out, we should look to whether or not countries have been able to protect their populations, particularly their most vulnerable um, through vaccinations. 
This is um, this graph um, shows that the deaths are increasing fastest in the countries with the lowest vaccination coverage. They're also the lowest income countries. And um, it's part of a commentary that we published this week in Nature. <clears throat> so talking about the future, of course, we have to talk about genetic variants and whether there will be a variant to emerge that completely changes the game on us. I would argue that uh, Omicron changed the game. It has shown the limited um, ability of non-pharmaceutical interventions to completely um, keep case numbers at a minimum. And it has shown how quickly the virus can explode in, in a given area. If you had told me in the summer that the United States would one day um, experience upwards of a million cases in a single day, I absolutely would not have believed that. Omicron exceeded even my highest level for predict uh, predictions for how large case numbers could grow. And we know that given the testing constraints that exist in the United States, that those numbers were represented a fraction of the infections um, that were occurring, possibly a, a smaller fraction of infections than at any other early point in the pandemic when we were doing a lot more testing. So um, we have to pay attention to uh, the emergence of variants. Unfortunately, our surveillance for this is not great. And um, as we show in this graph here, there's real heterogeneity in terms of how much countries are looking for genetic variants. Um, it's interesting, this graph shows it according to income and all these little circles represent countries. Uh, the United States, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the United States is, is over here to the, to the right-hand side. We used to be much further down, but we've increased the amount of sequencing that we're doing. Um, so there are many low-income countries that are doing a fair amount of, of sequencing, um, but we see a lot of countries sort of in the middle that aren't um, really measuring up to others. This is going to be a bigger problem. We are seeing and hearing about countries really pulling back on the amount of sequencing that they're doing and pulling back on the amount of sharing of the information that their sequencing efforts are generating, in part because of concerns that when countries announce the discovery of a new variant, they are often met with penalties such as travel restrictions. We know that this has had a chilling effect on countries' willingness to look, search, and report the discovery of genetic variants. And this will make us far less safe than um, the, the, the travel restrictions not putting them in would likely have done. So it's a really, really unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in. It's also complicated by the fact that many countries like the United States have really pulled back on the amount of testing that they're doing. And in order to be sequenced, to have a virus sequenced, someone first has to be diagnosed with an infection. So if we are testing far fewer people, we have a we are casting a much smaller net in order to find genetic variants. So genetic variants are a problem. The solution to, to dealing with genetic variants, first of all, is to increase vaccination coverage because the more people we can protect with vaccination, we will see a reduction in transmission. Even though vaccines don't prevent transmission, they do make you less likely to transmit if you become infected. And if we can help people recover from their infection faster, that's just less time for the virus to make copies of itself and less opportunities for mutations to emerge. Um, I will just say, and I don't wanna to take too much time, but I will just say the situation that we find ourselves in, I think for many people who haven't been working in the health um, security space or pan working on pandemic parents, I've been working on these issues for 20 years. It really felt like a once in a century crisis that came out of nowhere. And I have to tell you that's wrong. <laughs> it's just flat out wrong. Um, it is a very challenging crisis, but it is not a once in a century event. And I know this in part um, because uh, I'm part of a group that has published now two versions of the Global Health Security Index, which was um, a, a look at uh, countries' capacities to uh, respond, prevent, detect, and respond to significant infectious disease emergencies. We published our first Global Health Security Index in, um, in October of 2019, so just a few months before the pandemic. And we looked at um, six different categories of countries' capacities. And we found that no country was ready for an event like COVID-19. So it wasn't surprising that, we, that countries would then struggle with a pandemic that occurred a few months later. The United States um, is often kind of a, a 
it raises questions because the United States actually got, had the highest score in the Global Health Security Index, meaning it had more stuff than most other places and, and fewer risks. Um, but it was not without, um, uh, you know, it, it was not perfect. And the Global Health Security Index is scored on an absolute scale, meaning if you don't get a complete score, we still worry about you. And one place in particular where the United States scored quite poorly was in terms of healthcare access. We look at not just the sufficiency of healthcare, how much capacity there is to deal with infectious disease emergencies, but whether there are any barriers to people's accessing of care, including financial barriers, or whether countries have passed legislation to um, require the coverage of, of costs for people. The United States has not <laughs> done those things. And um, if, you, if you live here, you understand that it's not always easy or possible to access healthcare when you need it. And we flag this as a particular worry for the United States as it would head into a pandemic. Unfortunately, it turned out to become a problem for the United States. And here are just some um, headlines uh, from uh, throughout the course of the pandemic that illustrate how um, the lack of guaranteed um, coverage, uh, healthcare coverage, has, or even just the fear that people would be hit with surprise bills has really hindered the US response to the pandemic. At first it was tests, people were afraid to get tested because even though Congress passed legislation that would make it supposedly free, they were worried they were going to be hit by bills. And it turned out that some people did in fact get hit by surprise medical bills for what they thought and what should have been a free uh, service to be tested to see if they have COVID-19. Turns out that the insurance companies can still, you know, have some some requirements that may not be met um, by people seeking uh, testing. Same thing happened with the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, where people, even though they, these vaccines were free, were still worried that it was going to cost them something, and that cost concern was enough to keep people from getting vaccinated. And now, with the United States government having really run out of funding for its um, COVID response, it has asked Congress um, for, for more, but Congress so far has not provided more. Um, there are real concerns that this lapse in funding will reduce people's ability to get tested for COVID and um, to receive uh, free vaccinations if, they, if they're uninsured. So really, there is a lot that we still need to fix in the world to make us um, better prepared for events like COVID-19. We issued a new Global Health Security Index in 2021. We actually made some changes to the framework based on our learnings from COVID-19, but the overall message is the same. Um, countries still have a lot more work to do to get ready for these sorts of events. And no country got a perfect score. In fact, no country was even in the top tier. So there's just considerable gaps in countries' readiness um, for these sorts of events. I won't say too much about this except that these are our, our overall findings from the 2021 index, which we published in December. Um, I will say two things. One is that the index doesn't just look at health capacities. It also looks at um, international norms, countries' com commitments to international norms, and um, political, social, economic, environmental risks, risks that could hinder their ability to utilize the public health and medical capacities that they have. And um, I think some of my concerns surround the fact that um, while it was clear that countries built stuff they didn't have in order to respond to COVID-19, it's not at all clear that those capacities will remain after the pandemic is over. They're usually funded with emergency funds that are likely to disappear, just as we're seeing now in the United States, funding goes away and the abilities to respond suffer. Um, but also political and security risks overall are increasing in the world. And this is really going to hinder our abilities to respond to something like this simultaneously. It makes governments less able to respond domestically, and it also increases global risks that um, we will see significant disease emergencies um, from the fallout of these situations. And I'm glad that um, the latter half of the conversation we'll be talking about Ukraine, because that's clearly a concern there with a complete breakdown in government and a complete breakdown in infection control efforts, I mean, it won't be surprising if we see a worsening of many health conditions, including COVID-19. 
And this is just to show that countries did work hard to develop new capacities that they didn't have um, in response to COVID-19, but these are not necessarily plans that are going to stick around or last beyond the current crisis. And it's really an incredible shame to think that after all that hard work and trying to stand up capacities that were needed for COVID-19, that we would just let them erode. But unfortunately, I've been in this field long enough to see these cycles of panic and neglect play out over and over again, and that's exactly what I'm worried about. Um, there's also been a lot of um, uh, focus on the importance of trust. Trust is an important enabler for countries to respond to pandemics. We in the index measure all sorts of capacities, whether countries have COVID, you know, they have risk communication plans, whether they have surveillance capacities, whether they have laboratories to test specimens, to, to diagnose people who are infected, all sorts of things that are really helpful. But if there is limited trust in government, the utility of all of those capacities is greatly weakened. We've seen that in our case and death numbers, the greatest number of deaths throughout this pandemic have occurred after the development of life-saving vaccines. Certainly that's been true in the United States. We have seen more deaths since we started vaccinating, not because the vaccines don't work, but too few people want them. So we need to work to foster trust Unfortunately, in the Global Health Security Index, we see low levels of trust in government worldwide. And this is a real risk factor for going forward. And it will certainly be a challenge in many situations, including a future pandemic. In many ways, this is exacerbated by mis and disinformation. And I'm not gonna say much about this, except that we live in a world where we have a global information ecosystem. So it is not, just one country's problem, mis and disinformation is a global problem. We know countries are using it as an instrument of war, but it's also a problem, just generally speaking, where lies that are perpetuated by an actor in one country reach all the way around the globe. And this isn't an issue that we need to, to actively figure out how to tackle going forward. This is my last um, slide, but I really have to emphasize, my biggest fear is that we will come out of COVID-19 wipe our forehead and say, that was terrible. Glad we don't have to do that again. And that is unfortunately not the case. We live in an age of pandemic threats. There have been so many new diseases that have emerged as of late. People often say to me, it just feels like we keep hearing about these new viruses and new pathogens all the time. And the reason why it feels that way is because that is exactly what's happening. The frequency with which new pathogens are emerging. Pathogens, not all of them go on to cause pandemics. Some of them do. Some of them cause outbreaks. Some of them cause epidemics. Whether they go on to cause a pandemic is probably part biology, whether the pathogen has it in it. Also partially luck, who and where did it first occur? And also partially contingent on how we respond when these events happen. But if you take away nothing else from this, <laughs> Uh, lecture today, it's please understand that the frequency with which these sorts of events are happening is increasing. So pandemics are our new normal. We should expect more. It's the second one in my career. It's the third major coronavirus uh, that we have worried about. And that is not a coincidence. These things are happening more frequently. So we absolutely need to incorporate this into our our playbook for the future and figure out sustainable strategies so that we can respond to these events, not as once in a century crises, but the condition of our times. So with that, I'll end and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, that was really an a exciting, thought provoking presentation. I must say I had, three pages worth of notes. And I, I, rare, I rarely do uh, take as many. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, just a couple of questions to start. And uh, as I begin uh, those questions, I would like to uh, reach out to our audience and say, we certainly uh, look forward to a few questions. And uh, if, if by chance you do uh, have a question for Jennifer, uh, if you could just uh, put it in the Q&A 
and we'll do our best uh, within the time that we have available to cover uh, some of those questions. Um, just a couple of things that flow from your last remarks about the future, and also you mentioned them in the 2021 uh, Health Index survey. Um, you said that the world is unprepared in two areas, particularly that I remember. Uh, one was uh, finance, and another was this, the health system to uh, prepare for this new age of pandemic threats uh, that you uh, talked about. Um, and I wonder if you could say a little more about the kind of things, and you've talked a little about this in your foreign affairs pieces, I remember, uh, the kind of structures that the, the world as a whole needs, and maybe especially the role that uh, some of the Asian countries mm -hmm. in the United States uh, can play in helping those new broader uh, global systems in finance and um, health system development to come to pass. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's, and you're absolutely right, those are areas of deep concern, sort of countries' financial commitments um, to addressing their capacity gaps, um, you know, and, and maintaining them. Um, this has been a real problem uh, in the field of global health security. There's been a, a global effort for many years now to try to understand where the gaps are. And our index builds on something called the WHO's Joint External Evaluation Process, which is a voluntary process by which countries can sign up to um, have an external evaluation of their capacities um, to implement the IHRs, but basically to, to deal with infectious disease emergencies that can spread across borders. Mm -hmm. And it's a really valuable process. Uh, it's, it's, if you've ever been in a situation, if you read the document, you, you can see it's an important strategic planning for countries to sit down and say, you know, what can we do? What can't we do? Do we have this? Don't we have this? Where would we struggle? I think it's incredibly valuable. The problem has been there's never been funding to help countries fill gaps. That's been a source of of limitations in, in these efforts. So they know what they can't do, but then they have a hard time garnering funding to help build the things that they need. Um, and this is part because global financing mechanisms have largely favored response and not preparedness. So, you know, when there's an emergency somewhere in the world, the resources get marshaled. Mm. Um, but in order to invest in countries um, to for the purposes of preparedness, there's been much far less limited funding for that. That mm -hmm. is starting to change a little bit. But ultimately, it comes down to individual countries. And this is where I think it gets challenging because there are clearly countries with more resources to do this than others, but there is no country with no resources. And so yeah. countries make decisions about how they're going to allocate those resources. And um, you know, if you if you work with colleagues in low-income settings like I have, you know, these are incredibly talented professionals whose biggest frustration is not getting more political support for their work in the countries in which they work. Health has not been the most politically uh, ha has had the the health sector has not had the most political pull um, in in countries. Sure. So that has been a challenge, um, but um, I think things are changing a bit um, in the sense that, you know, the, the thing about pandemics is it really changes the kinetics of a response. When you have an, an epidemic of say Ebola, it's in one part of the world and the rest of the world spared and they can send resources to help. But in, in a pandemic, it's every country affected at once and effectively every country on its own. For better or for worse, that's that's the situation. So really, it does come down to, to national capacities and national strengths. And the health system, as you rightly point out, is the place of probably weakest, the, the, the area that's that's weakest. It certainly was weakest in the United States, and it's weakest in, in many, many countries. It's not just weakest in terms of we don't have enough capacity to handle this surge of patients who now need care, which we saw everywhere countries overwhelmed by a surge of patients that infected with COVID that needed care. They also couldn't deliver care for all of the other health conditions that continue to go on in the midst of a pandemic, thus worsening outcomes there. Um, for me, the single biggest 
moment in this pandemic where I realized this is unlike anything the world has really gone through was seeing pictures from Times Square in New York City empty. Mm. And it was empty because everything shut down because we were trying to flatten the curve below the line and the line was healthcare capacity. We were acutely worried that the number of infections was going to outpace the availability to provide life-saving care in emergency rooms and intensive care units. This is everywhere. And it's not just a problem in terms of those acute patient care needs. It's not just a problem because we will not be able to save the lives of people that we could otherwise save, COVID plus heart attacks, plus cancer, plus all those other things that get interrupted. But it's also a problem when it comes down to trust. So I have spent mm -hmm. the past two years talking to all manner of people about COVID. Many of them are deeply skeptical about the virus, but I've also spent a lot of time talking to people about the vaccine. And I can tell you in no point in my career have I ever encountered so much mis and disinformation when it comes to vaccines as I have with the COVID vaccine. But the most common element in all of those conversations is that people say to me, I just don't know who to trust. And I say to them, do you think you could talk to your doctor or your healthcare provider? And almost always they say they don't have one. So the ability of healthcare to be there and to help people and to provide quality services that people come to trust and rely upon is absolutely essential when it comes to a pandemic. Because you can't just drop into somebody's life in the midst of an emergency and say, here, take this, wear this, do this. Trust me, I know you don't know who I am because I haven't been there for you. Mm. Now, that's really, really sobering, sobering to hear. Um, now, you mentioned uh, many things, the sort of financial uh, mechanisms, and that we tend to be uh, backward looking rather than preparedness oriented. Um, now, maybe some of these multilateral uh, organizations are an expression of that, but I've been sort of following with quite a bit of interest some of the multilateral vaccination schemes. Of course, COVID, uh, COVAX is one within Asia, APVAX that the Asian Development Bank uh, developed. Uh, we have, well, you may recall, actually, you were in, uh, involved in the webinar that we did with them. Uh, so the, maybe there are some differences, but it seems like the, the broad global programs just have not um, done what hopefully they could have done. I, looking at your map and Africa, you know, 20% vaccinated or so. Uh, COVAX hasn't been able to, well, I, I just wonder what your assessment of COVAX is and how it could be improved. So I think there are a few lessons coming out of COVID-19. The first one I absolutely predicted, which is that in a crisis like this, a global crisis, it will be every country for itself. And that doesn't mean that multilateral efforts aren't worthwhile. They absolutely are, but we have to be realistic about what they can do. Um, I think it was never going, to, it was never clear that countries would donate enough vaccines for the global need. And we saw this in 2009 in the H1N1 crisis. You know, um, we did a report um, just shortly before the pandemic. And that was one of the lessons that came out of that report saying that countries in 2009, when we, we knew we were gonna have vaccine because it's, it was a flu virus and we could, you know, kind of turn, turn a few switches and, and make pandemic vaccine when we normally make seasonal flu vaccine, many countries pledged to donate doses. But what they ultimately delivered was much fewer and came much later than what they promised. And when it actually arrived, it was basically too late. So I don't know why we head into this pandemic thinking anything else would happen. Now, I think at the end of the day, we cannot rely on donations to solve our, our global vaccination problems. And I think you're gonna see increasing, and I think for, for Asia, this will be an important thing to pay attention to, an increasing push for regional vaccine manufacturing and regional approaches where um, at least uh, there are some, some more constrained agreements in terms of, of production, manufacturing, and sharing. I just think at the global level, it's, it's, it's impossible to overcome the politics. 
Um, not to say that we, there shouldn't be global efforts that support it, but unless we have the abilities for countries to have more control over what gets made where, I just don't see how this is fixed. We have just a few vaccine companies in the world um, right now. And what we saw in, in COVID-19 is it wasn't money that limited it. It was countries couldn't even get on the list or they got on the list to buy vaccines, but they got bumped down the list because not all money was green. <laughs> Sorry to use yeah. US currency as the, the base case there, yeah. but um, yeah. they got um, outmaneuvered by other countries that had stronger political ties with the companies mm -hmm. and could you know, put in their order for boosters before countries even got their orders there for first and second doses. What do you think in that regard of this uh, uh, quad uh, project? Uh, the U.S. played uh, some significant role in starting it. And I guess because India suddenly had the upsurge, it didn't yeah. operate as rapidly as possible. But I guess that was the summit last year among the quad members, the U.S., India, Japan, and Australia. Uh, is that the kind of regional uh, manufacturing or distribution that you're talking about? I think it's a little bit closer. Um, some people, though, have suggested that really where you need to manufacture is in small population countries, because then you don't have as much of risk that the country is going to nationalize mm -hmm. what it has, what it experiences a setback. Um, but yes, now, what I have not been able to figure out about these approaches and just, you know, it's a clear limitation that needs to be worked through is that in order to manufacture a vaccine, you have to know what you're gonna make. I mean, these, these plants are incredibly bespoke. And so you sort of have to kind of pick a, pick a technology and then make it. You can't just turn it on in, in a pandemic. And so we don't know what the next pandemic is going to be caused by, and we don't know what type of vaccination approach may be the best one. Everybody's excited about mRNA technology, but it may not be the best. Um, so um, it's hard to kind of, that's like a game of chess that's very hard to, to, uh -huh. to play, um, but it's also going to have to involve funding risk, you know, just, just buying down risk and making multiple bets um, because we just don't know what's going to pay off. But I think it has to be tied to, to routine vaccinations um, because as we saw with the Johnson & Johnson facility in Baltimore, you can't just kind of try to turn on in the midst of pandemic and make a high quality vaccine. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, of course, um, on COVID-19, Belgium, if I'm not mistaken, has been a production site uh, for uh, Pfizer. And uh, in Asia, one wonders that the, what flashes into my mind, maybe a place like Singapore, is that that has quality manufacturing. And uh, of course they have uh, some people in their policy process who are real professionals, something like that. Not necessarily that, but one of the smaller ones, I don't know, maybe Korea or. Somewhere. Yeah. I think there's a lot more capacity that we didn't tap. Um, you know, we, we just heard of a lot of uh, manufacturing centers asking, you know, for, relaxation of patents and and technology you know it's not just the recipe it's also um uh you know teaching places how to do it um so i think that there's more capacity that could be marshaled um but we mm -hmm. also have to work through those those political issues and and um that that's the proposal that i've heard that I you see. know perhaps in a small population center it might overcome the politics thank but, you. you know these are early ideas that still need to be fleshed out we uh, have a couple of uh, questions uh, one really uh, was about, maybe I could just ask you a couple and then you could give some uh, concluding mm -hmm. remarks. Wh whether you had seen any technological advances in Asia in particular that uh, could be helpful in, in coping with future pandemics, I guess it relates to that mm -hmm. issue of vaccines that you were just talking about. Um, another question, how can we incentivize countries to uh, share information on sequencing and tracking of new variants? It uh, seems that, I mean, China did share in January things, but it must have been somewhat slow. Um, then the, the big question that I has really been in my mind for so long, and I don't know exactly what to ask, and you're the perfect person I would think to answer. You know, Asia did so well in the beginning, mm -hmm. 
in, in confronting this pandemic. And yet later on, um, it hasn't, doesn't seem, uh, generally speaking, uh, to have done uh, so well. And um, you mentioned future pandemics. How do you sort of look at the trajectory of, of Asia in general? And of course, Japan's a country especially interested in both what it's been in the past and you know how its prospective role uh, might uh, should uh, evolve in the future. Yeah, so maybe starting with that and working backwards, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think um, there were two factors of that contributed to the recent situation with the rise in cases in Asia. Um, one I said is the virus. It just, I think, outran um, many of the um, public health efforts that had been relied upon. The other one was fatigue. I mean, it's incredibly hard to maintain this response posture for going on three years. It's hard from an operational standpoint, the people in government who have been doing it are tired, um, but it's also hard from a societal standpoint. You know, people want to get back to normal. They're tired of restrictions. They want to go mm. back to their lives. And, and there, there, there was some evidence that there was a, relaxed, a relaxing of restrictions due to the economic consequences of shutting down businesses, et cetera. Um, I, I don't say that with blame. I think that the idea that we can keep things shut down for, for years and, and to restrict people in terms of what they want to do and where they want to go, um, it just doesn't seem feasible to me for the long term. And I don't think that that's, that's a sustainable long term response. Um, I think certainly once vaccines become available, um, the idea is how do we optimize their use such that we take off the table the virus's ability to put people in the hospital um, and 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 kill them. Um, mm -hmm. If we didn't have a vaccine, which is the scenario that keeps me up late at night, you know, what if this weren't a coronavirus? We had a lot of research about coronaviruses. What if it weren't a coronavirus? We didn't have a vaccine within a year. Um, I think what we really need to do then is, is equip people with more tools to not prevent them from living in certain ways, but to enable them to do so more safely than they would otherwise. You know, in public health, there's a term harm reduction, where you don't tell people you can't do this, but you say, if you're, go if you're going to do this, here is how you do it more safely. And I think rapid tests help enable that. The piece that we didn't fix with rapid tests in many countries were financial policies that didn't penalize people for testing positive. Financial support policies that allow people to isolate. I will tell you, I am not a fan of, of forced isolation and isolation away from people's families. I would rather have give people the option um, to isolate as safely as they feel because I do fear that it, it drives cases underground. Um, so I think that's what we have to think about in the future. Uh, respiratory viruses are not easy to contain like we contain Ebola. They're just different. They will go on forever. They will not disappear from the planet. I do not think there was ever a hope that we could eliminate or eradicate COVID-19. So we always needed a plan to transition to one where we were living with the virus, but to do so as safely as possible. And fortunately, vaccines and therapeutics help us, but so do some of the other tools. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of innovations from Asia, I will tell you, Asia is the place that taught us the most about how best to control COVID and also the, the environments in which it was transmitting and um, the, the, just the basic epidemiology about who was giving it to who, when and where. And um, that was in part tech enabled. Um, technology that maybe doesn't translate well to other settings like the United States, but um, I think does offer promise that if we can deal with some of the social civil liberties and other issues, um, we could learn a lot more than we were able to learn in the United States. So really kudos to that. Um, Singapore is a great example of their, their epidemiology. I mean, they were, they were publishing these transmission chains that allowed us to learn so much about the virus and how it was spreading and incredibly grateful. And uh, South Korea did the same. South Korea was really extraordinary with how quickly it scaled up testing and they really implemented the drive-through testing approaches. So really, I think uh, many countries in Asia led on those very innovative um, scaled solutions um, that I think the rest of the the world learned about. And, you know, also mask culture is something that we're still struggling to, to learn in the United States. I don't think masks, we're totally done with masks. Um, I would like to see us use them as a form of etiquette, like many other countries have been doing for a very long time. So we still have a ways to go. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. We, you've uh, taught us a lot. I know we've all enjoyed this. Uh, we appreciate your role. We appreciate 
over our long project, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and so many people in so many places who have supported and encouraged this project. And uh, we appreciate uh, the audience. And uh, well, again, Jennifer, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone All for best listening. Wishes. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, as our next uh, speaker, we would like to uh, transition from looking at the past and the pandemic itself to looking more uh, broadly at uh, changes in the world. Uh, and of course, one of the most important recently has been uh, the tragic conflict uh, in the Ukraine and its uh, global implications. And to speak to that, we have as our next uh, speaker, Mr. Hirokazu Saito, who's currently a senior advisor on Eurasian affairs at Mitsubishi Corporation. And also I'm pleased to say uh, an associate visiting uh, fellow uh, at the Reischauer Center for uh, East Asian Studies with us right here. Um, he is a fluent Russian speaker. He's served in many uh, positions in uh, Russia and also the near abroad, of course, uh, both in his, in his professional work and uh, with Mitsubishi Corporation. He's followed very carefully uh, the evolution of commodity markets um, and has dealt with a number of um, important institutions. Uh, in Japan um, and across Eurasia as a whole. And so he's going to, uh, we look forward very much uh, to your remarks. Saito-san, welcome to the Reischauer Center. Thank you very much, Dr. Kent Calder. I'm very pleased to, to participate in this webinar, especially today uh, from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, as you introduced me, uh, maybe it is easier for me to speak in Russian better than English, but I try to speak in English, my, uh, although my English is poor. Okay, anyway, uh, let me start. Uh, I think all of us may be interested to know how and when WHO will call an end to the global COVID crisis. While numbers of cases have fallen in many places, uh, WHO is not currently considering such a declaration. Many nations around the world have already taken steps to return to more normal social economic activities, even relaxing masking and quarantine guide guidelines and opening borders to travel. Uh, today, uh, we are talking about the post-COVID world. However, in addition to such circumstances, I would like to uh, share with you another impact to the world, that is Ukraine conflict. Uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, president of Russian Federation, decided special military operation to Ukraine on February 24th. It was already more than one month ago. Uh, by the way, now in Russia, the use of words such like invasion, aggression, and war is prohibited in this regard. And do you know, first name of Putin, Vladimir, means rule the world in Russian language. So they say it is special military operation. But everybody sees actually it is not an operation, but it must be war, although Russia did not declare. That may be an international public opinion. Now, the West, being led by the United States, has imposed the anti Russian sanctions with a sense of speed and unity unlike at the time of Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014, and has accused Russia and demanded the immediate withdrawal of army from the territory of Ukraine. But Russian President Vladimir Putin, who has started this war, does not seem to take a step back and even has shown a strong stance that he would continue to achieve his goals 
as far as he started with demands to Ukraine, demilitarization, denazification, acknowledgement of independence of Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, acknowledgement of Crimea belonging to Russia, and so on. And then the situation is showing signs of a prolongation. Now ceasefire negotiations are going and it was announced some progress was made at yesterday's negotiation in Istanbul, but breakthrough agreement will not be expected so easily. Even if it will be reached in the short term, the big waves that have already begun are isolating Russia from the international community and markets. On the other hand, Ukraine, which is under brutal attack by Russia and will need time for its recovery, has been virtually or actually separated from the international markets, unfortunately, despite supports of the international community. As being the situation, that might be a start of Cold War 2.0, the independent the dependence on Russia and or Ukraine for various commodities is giving us some levels of impacts in the commodity markets directly and indirectly. It is because Russia and Ukraine are key suppliers of certain commodities which are and will be running short of supply in the international markets. In other words, I'm afraid two big suppliers are leaving the global market. That means imbalance of supply and demand shall be created in the global economy. Now, I would like to uh, share with you some papers on the screen. Uh, first of all, I would like to draw your attention to the energy sector, oil and gas and coal. Just yesterday, President Biden of US spoke with President Macron of France, Chancellor Scholz of Germany, Prime Minister Draghi of Italy, and Prime Minister Johnson of UK. And they discussed the importance of supporting stable energy markets in light of current disruptions due to sanctions. Please look at the table, energy self-sufficiency rate and dependency on Russia. As you may be aware, Russia is the second largest exporter of crude oil after Saudi Arabia and the number one exporter of natural gas. United States decided to ban Russian oil import and the UK followed it by end of this year. However, as you can see, self-sufficiency rate on energy resources in Japan is very low. Almost 100% of procurement of energy resources depends upon uh, import from abroad. And the problem is that Germany, France, and other European countries highly dependent on Russia for energy resources. These countries impose severe anti-Russian sanctions against which Russia recognized them as unfriendly countries. While many Asian countries do not impose anti-Russian sanctions, the possible reorientation of Russian exports of oil, gas, and coal from the United States and the European countries to Asian importers will be a big economic shock. Oil price doubled compared with that one year ago. As for oil, there are oil stocks, so-called strategic petroleum reserve in many countries. And moreover, OPEC and non-OPEC countries have additional oil production capacity. So I think market might be expected to be stable, even if it would be at high price level. 
critical problem is natural gas. Storage level is going down and now standing at less than one fourth of full capacity. Usually it's fulfilled in summer season, but now does it go in this year under the current situation? Supply of pipeline gas from Russia to Europe will be stopped. How to secure natural gas storage during summertime this year for this winter season? Price for gas in European market is going extremely high, but the problem is not only for price, but also more important for supply of gas itself. Besides, I'm afraid to think that Russian's decision to introduce a ruble payment for natural gas with unfriendly countries may cause reinvestment in the extractive industries, risking reversing the trend toward the transition of the planet to clean energy upon goal of carbon neutral. It means we might be obliged to reconsider its goal to be possibly postponed. Besides the energy sector, Russia is a big player on nickel. LME, London Metal Exchange, faced jump of nickel price by 250% within 24 hours, so-called devil's 18 minutes on March 8th. On the background there was Russian factor. Russian nickel producer Norilsk Nickel is handling about 10% of nickel market. And Norilsk Nickel is also a supply of palladium with market share more than 40%, which is used for production of semiconductor. As for production of semiconductor, it is said that neon, that is in rare gas, is used as a laser light source for semiconductor production equipment. And the neon from uh, Ukraine is account for about 50% of global market share. Shortage of supply of semiconductor may occur. It may influence on automobile industry and others widely. Please see this table. This may be more important, that is, grain export ex Russia and Ukraine, and price up on crops such as wheat, barley, corn. Shortage of supply of wheat may increase price not only for wheat itself, but also for bread in the market. Barley and corn being utilized as livestock feed may run short. Then it may influence on price for meat and meat products they will product relatedly. Russia and Ukraine are playing important roles to supply these products for people's life in the world. If these quantities would run out, of course, market demand might be covered by stocks in the short term. But how about in the middle and long term? I think you might be getting worried about a normal life and food security in the future. So lastly, I'd like to propose to let us think together. We have to be more united and cooperative in the world to overcome the situation and solve some possible problems related to energy and food securities, which will impact on our life in the short term. What? And how should we do now? This is a question. And uh, at last, I hope that Ukraine conflict, I mean the war in Ukraine, would stop as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much, um, Saito-san. Um, I know that 
we have a lot of interest in you've addressed some really fundamental questions i'm sure there's a lot of interest and i invite any questions uh in the q and a please uh as we go forward uh please uh participants feel free to uh put questions into the q and a but um maybe to start out i wonder if you could elaborate a little more on the timing of the problems that you are talking about. Presumably the wor world has uh, stockpiles now, uh, but then of course futures markets and so on move very rapidly. Um, are the uh, shortages that uh, in, in these various commodities um, going to relate to they I guess they certainly will relate to the course of the war the length of war continues but there's been so much destruction and so on too one should imagine that even if we were to get a uh, ceasefire in the very near future uh, mo many people most people I think think it will take some time maybe some months before we get that um how how long uh, are will we be able really to sustain um, stable prices um, in these various areas? It sounds like, from what you say, the most volatile area probably is going to be natural gas. Is that right? Is that the most vol volatile of the various commodities that you've discussed? Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I'm afraid to say now since uh, fires negotiations are going, but the uh, reaction of Russian delegation is not made clearly at that time of negotiation. Ukrainian side proposed some idea, but the Russian side just noted and he they will uh, report to President Putin. In any case, at last, Putin will decide. But uh, as far as I know, uh, proposal from Ukrainian side does not uh, satisfy Putin's uh, wish. So it takes time to uh, uh, make ceasefire. But uh, even uh, some uh, compromise would be made and the fire uh, situation might be just temporarily stopped. But uh, the West, which already uh, imposed uh, so many sanctions, such sanctions uh, are not released. In that sense, maybe a supply of natural gas, especially to European market, that is some kind of tool for Russian side as a counter sanction, because already they propose the payment should be in ruble. That is a, a violence of contract conditions already. But uh, from supply side, they can stop delivery of gas to Europe. Of course, that is also a very big impact for Russian side to get uh, hard currency money. So, uh, in any case, uh, uh, this year, how they, uh, will, they will do maybe in summertime for uh, some uh, fulfillment of gas reserve in Europe. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, as for uh, uh, especially wheat and barley, I mean uh, uh, grain from Ukraine. Now under current situation in Ukraine, for this year, harvest of grains may be not expected. And also this year, uh, no all work in the field farming, no farming. So uh, in next year, of course, no harvest. So supply ability, I mean, a quantity, exported quantity from Ukraine in the uh, international market uh, decreased then such a shortage, how uh, and when 
uh, would influence on the market and also for our lives Look, or is, our life. Well, is it is possible? It looks like, or it sounds to me from what you say, that we probably on the food side, the wheat side, will face uh, the physical shortages really probably late this year. Presumably, mm -hmm. there were stockpiles already, but if there's no harvest in the Ukraine or very little, then there are going to be some serious shortages uh, later this year, and in anticipation of that, probably huge price increases. So yeah. uh, this will hit uh, the poorest of the poor, and you know, countries I guess that have uh, less in the way of food supplies. You know, uh, putting all this together, I, I should just ask you, isn't there a possibility with rising interest rates uh, globally because of the inflation problem um, mm. and the dollar, perhaps the dollar rising? And then in addition, on top of this, all of these food, the commodity price rises that developing countries that lack oil and that are also highly populous. One thinks of, say, Egypt, or maybe some other Middle Eastern, non-oil Middle East countries, or Africa, or Bangladesh. Countries yeah. like that are going to have serious problems and possibly financial crises. Is that, what do you think about that possibility? Yeah, uh, I'm not an economist, uh, especially. But uh, as you said, I agree with you. Because already uh, some uh, economic situation in Egypt is uh, getting uh, worse because of some shortage of supply of wheat. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, just uh, some day afraid of uh, some kind of an, uh, food security. Mm -hmm. And also, as you said, in Africa or in Bangladesh, such developing countries, of course, a uh, price increase, inflation, big inflation is also a big impact for their economy. Mm -hmm. So just sure. uh, well, I can. I, you you point to some very important problems. We have a, a question, interesting question from the floor, that uh, relates to this. And um, one of our Reichauer fellows is asking, uh, do you see a path for the international community to make up for this global food shortage on short notice? And I might add. The United States and well, Australia, uh, Canada. I mean, some of the major nations that have been very concerned about the Ukraine crisis. One wonders uh, what kind of role, what kind of responsibility do they have, and or are they simply? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering about that. What about the international community's role in dealing with this? Yeah, of course, and that's for food supply. Uh, for example, USA or Australia have uh, enough capacity to supply, but uh, harvest is always uh, depending upon the climate also. So uh, maybe some limitation. I mean, uh, uh, to cover whole quantities uh, which was supplied by R Ukraine and Russia, it's very difficult, actually. So in that <laughs> sense, uh, uh, I don't see... Your pessimistic What's the outcome. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, that is a sobering uh, thought. Well, now finally, if we could all, uh, we have a, a, a one final participant that uh, would, would, I know, has tremendous insights on the issues that we're considering. And I wonder if he might join us for some final uh, comments. This is uh, Dr. Uh, professor William Brooks. Um, he's been an adjunct professor here at uh, SAIS, the Reichauer Center since 2010. After retiring from the State Department, uh, he spent 15 years as head of the embassy, uh, US Embassy Tokyo's media analysis and translation unit, uh, which looked at the impact of Japanese media trends uh, on uh, the United States. And um, I, he has a PhD from Columbia University 
And um, I'm happy to say that he has taught over the years on several occasions at SICE, most recently since 2010, as we said, but also um, uh, before, even before he entered the State Department. Bill, um, you've heard two different presentations about the pandemic and then the transition to a new world uh, that is emerging, including this troubling conflict in the Ukraine. I wonder what uh, comments you might have uh, regarding all of this. Absolutely. Thank you for your introduction, uh, Ken. Um, the main takeaway I'm getting from both presentations, which were absolutely uh, uh, excellent, outstanding, uh, is that we're never going to return to a new normal, whether it is uh, in terms of the pandemic. Um, I'm getting ready for my fourth uh, shot, my booster shot, uh, or uh, the impact of uh, Putin's uh, game-changing uh, uh, of the uh, global system uh, by uh, invasion of Ukraine. The ripple effects uh, are hitting Asia, uh, obviously other countries you've mentioned, uh, but I'd like to focus most of my comments in the remaining time on, on Japan, it's particularly. Um, Japan, uh, even with the, uh, the pandemic and before the uh, Ukraine invasion, uh, the economy was indeed suffering. Uh, uh, there had been uh, uh, a loss of the tourism and other sources of income that are associated with traveling and business in Japan. Uh, the country was basically uh, closed, it's still closed uh, to uh, uh, casual travelers. Uh, some students are coming in now. Uh, but also uh, uh, the supply chains uh, across the uh, Asia uh, have been disrupted first. Uh, and foremost by the uh, the pandemic. Uh, for example, uh, Japan's uh, 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 reliance uh, on China uh, is a particularly uh, significant. Uh, according to uh, the statistics I have, uh, Japan uh, imports almost all of its uh, personal computers uh, and uh, laptops, table uh, and uh, tablets uh, from China and many other uh, electronic components. Uh, so the disruptions of the, uh, uh, of the supply chains that hurt Japan's economy as well. Secondly, uh, Japan's economy has been hurt by the, uh, the, the sort of uh, depreciation of the, the yen to uh, a level of 122 to, to one, even 125 is expected, um, which has made uh, not only uh, Japanese exports more expensive, uh, but also has made it more expensive to import the energy. Uh, but uh, I, I don't want to just talk about gloom and doom. Uh, the impact of Ukraine on Japan has been significant. Uh, it has lined itself up uh, absolutely with uh, the US and, and NATO in imposing draconian sanctions uh, on Russia. Uh, and uh, almost everything that uh, the US and NATO have done uh, in terms of uh, isolating uh, Russia economically, uh, Japan has fallen in line. Uh, it has not uh, stopped its imports of uh, oil and gas from Sakhalin. Uh, and uh, that may come in the future. Hopefully, uh, it doesn't have to do so, uh, because according to uh, what I've heard from my contacts uh, in Japan, if indeed Japan did stop importing uh, Russian oil and gas, uh, probably China would take over those concessions, uh, and uh, probably Japan would never get them back. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, the re response from Russia for Japan's basically crossing the Rubicon and, and lining up with the West and, and uh, sort of dumping uh, Putin uh, after years of cultivating his uh, personal ties at the summit level, uh, the response from Russia has been uh, dramatic. Uh, it has cut off peace talks. 
uh, and by implication uh, talks over the contested territorial issue. Uh, and uh, uh, there are signs uh, already uh, that uh, Russia uh, will probably uh, treat Japan as an unfriendly nation uh, in its uh, other uh, emergency uh, uh, declarations. So the the uh, Japan's uh, resolve on this issue has been significant. And uh, uh, the, the interesting thing is that the Japanese public go along with uh, this uh, decision of Japan to line up uh, after many, many years of toing and froing to line up against Russia and its Ukraine invasion. Um, the, uh, uh, according to an Asahi poll, which uh, came out quite recently, uh, March 19th uh, and 20th, 67% of Japanese said that Japan should continue to impose economic sanctions on Russia over the Ukraine invasion, even if doing so would hurt the Japanese economy. So the, the public lines up with uh, the government on that. However, 90% of the same population are worried that the Russian invasion of Ukraine might develop into a wider war with other nations. Uh, another poll uh, found that 80% of Japanese were worried about Japan's national security being possibly being undermined by Russia's aggression in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, in a follow-up question, 90% uh, of Japanese are now worried about what will happen next uh, in their area, in the region, particularly uh, with China possibly invade uh, Taiwan. So Japan's uh, the bold decision to, su to support the U.S. and, and NATO uh, has already had uh, dramatic repercussions vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russia, uh, but it also could uh, rethink relationship uh, with uh, China, uh, on which Japan uh, relies heavily for certain uh, high-tech and consumer items. Um, and that's basically my comment. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your remarks, Bill. Um, I wondered if it, we might have also uh, Saito-san, if uh, he could come back on the screen, um, because we, uh, I think I, I just wanted to express uh, personal thanks. Unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time, uh, but to, to but both to you, Bill, and, and also to uh, Hirokazu Saito, uh, an old friend of the Reichauer Center, uh, whom, whose support we certainly appreciate. Um, and also, of course, to our audience, to uh, the, all the people who have helped us. Uh, if, I don't know if, if uh, Neve and if the, all the, is also with us and uh, Lauren and, uh, and Izumi or any who are here. If they, uh, I wanted certainly to to thank everyone who has been involved in in this presentation, and in uh, the last two years of a pro our project on uh, COVID and its implications for the world uh, that we have had. Um, this is a continuing discussion, uh, as you can see. I wish only wish there were more chance to probe your ideas, Bill, and, and Saito-san's and uh, uh, Dr. Nuzzo's uh, ideas as well. Um, so this is a continuing process. And uh, I know all of us, including our audience, uh, look forward to continuing these dialogue about uh, the post-COVID world and uh, what we all can do about the challenges ahead. So Saito-san, I know it's uh, it's late now. It's almost midnight for you <laughs> over in Tokyo. Thank yeah. you so much for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our audience and uh, looking forward to the new occasion, next occasion. Thanks very much, everyone.